Welcome to Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a Patreon-sponsored series where we select five Patreon supporters at random and investigate cases from their hometowns. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can support us on Patreon by following the link below. And now let's dive in with cold cases from your hometowns, the mysteries that strike too close to home. Dean Marie Peters. Our first case for this month's Too Close to Home comes from our patron Lizzie Ghetto Story, who chose the city of Grand Rapids in Michigan. It was once known as America's furniture capital and continues to remain a prominent furniture manufacturer today, although it is perhaps most notable now for its incredible art museums. Home to over 190,000 residents, Grand Rapids is the backdrop for some of Michigan's most compelling mysteries. Dean Marie Peters, who was generally known as Deanie to those around her, was born on September 24, 1966, to Mary Peets and Dwayne Pyle. She had a younger brother named William, and the family resided in California until the divorce. Following this, William, Deanie, and their mother moved to Michigan, where Mary met and married a man named John Peters. The sibling's father, Dwayne, remained in California, where he too remarried. Initially, Dini struggled to fit in and adjust to life in the city of Grand Rapids, but she eventually found her footing and began to make friends. A clever and fun-loving girl, Dini was a good student and had no problems with her family. She was not known to run away and had dreams of one day becoming a model. Her good behavior and seemingly happy home life are what made her sudden disappearance in the 1980s all the more strange. On February 5th, 1981, 14-year-old Deanie accompanied her mother to Williams Wrestling Practice, which was held at Forest Hills Central Middle School in the 5800 block of Ada Drive. At around 5 p.m., she asked her mother if she could go to the restroom. Mary consented, and Deanie wandered off. But she never returned. When investigators arrived on the scene, they quickly discovered that the 14-year-old hadn't even made it to the restroom. No one saw her enter the women's toilets, and no witnesses recalled her even being in the area. In fact, she was last seen walking out of the gym, although accounts differ as to whether she was going out for a smoke or leaving to go and visit a friend. Deanie left behind her jewelry, makeup, purse, bag, clothing, and several hundred dollars at home when she vanished. She never returned for them. Her family thought this was odd, as she was the type of girl who wore makeup most days, if not every day, and authorities felt that if the teen had run away, she would have taken her money with her. One potential suspect in the initial inquiry was the school's custodian, a man named Arthur Diaz, who claimed that he never saw Dini as he cleaned out an office on the evening of February 5th. It was theorized that Diaz had put the teenager's body in the school incinerator, but detectives found no evidence to support this idea. He was shortly thereafter ruled out as a possible suspect. Digging further into Dini's social life, investigators uncovered that just two days before she went missing, the 14-year-old had engaged in a physical fight at school with two girls. The fight was said to be over a boy, and the girls told Deanie to stay away from him, threatening her if she didn't do as they said. A 17-year-old boy named Bruce Bunch knew one of the girls. It has been alleged that on the day of her disappearance, he spotted Deanie walking and drove his car at her to scare her. However, instead of narrowly avoiding her or stopping his vehicle, he hit a patch of ice and accidentally struck the girl killing her. It's possible that he hid her body in the brush and then later buried it, possibly in the Snow Avenue area. This area was searched in 2010, but no evidence of a body was ever discovered. Over the years, Bunch allegedly told various versions of this story, including to his first and second wives. His first wife claimed that Bunch was abusive and violent, and that he would drink so heavily he would sometimes black out and not remember his own actions. He once pushed her out of a moving vehicle, causing her to break her ankle, and once threatened to run her off the road. Those who knew Bunch alleged that he said that Deanie's body was buried by a young marine camp, but a search of the area turned up nothing. Others said that Bunch dreamt about the teenager following her disappearance. 
He claimed that although he did dream about her once, it was because he'd seen the news of her disappearance on the TV. As a young child, he had claimed to have mental telepathy. Bunch said that this combination had led to him dreaming about the missing teen, and that this then led to people circulating the story that he had killed her and hidden the body. Further stories spread after he allegedly talked about Deanie at a party, where he said he'd buried her body near Standard School, five miles north of Lowell. This site was searched, but nothing was found. Bunch died of a heart attack in 2008. He was never charged nor questioned in connection with Deanie's disappearance. During the initial investigation, divers searched a shallow pond along Grand River Drive near Lowell, Michigan, and used cadaver dogs in a bid to try and find any evidence of Deanie. However, they were unable to find a single clue in her case. Psychics got involved too, pointing detectives in the direction of potential burial sites. But these searches turned up nothing. Deanie's parents spoke to the media regularly to try and keep interest in the case alive, and even put forward a reward for information. But again, no new leads opened up. Other theories in Deanie's case revolve around another potential suspect and police involvement. Reportedly, her diary vanished while in the possession of law enforcement, leading some to believe that the culprit involved in the disappearance had ties to authorities or was a serving member of the police force themselves. The other potential suspect in Deanie's case was a man named Joseph Falstrom, who was questioned by investigators twice in the early 90s. A woman came forward to the media later on, telling them that she and some friends had been drinking and canoeing with Falstrom on Flat River in 1989. He had spoken about how he and two others had hit a girl named Deanie with their car while in a school parking lot, and that they'd put her body in the trunk before later burying her along the river. However, nothing further seems to have come from this information. Deanie's case dried up in the 1990s, but was eventually revived in 2008. Between 2008 and 2012, authorities spoke with over 200 witnesses and searched 15 potential burial sites. Their investigation took them to seven states and helped them establish the identities of individuals living in the Ada Drive area who may have information. However, none of them have cooperated so far. In 2021, authorities announced that they believe Bruce Bunch was responsible for Deanie's death. However, they have never been able to verify his story about accidentally hitting her with his car. Investigators believe that there are more people who know the truth of what happened that day, and they could help solve the case once and for all. One woman who is thought to have this information still lives in the area and has failed a polygraph test. In July that same year, 61-year-old James Douglas Frisbee was charged with perjury in connection with Deanie's case. He was 21 at the time and had a criminal record dating back to 1978, although he was never convicted of a felony. He was suspected of lying about information, knowledge, and or statements he made to the police about possible suspects or witnesses in what is, according to court documents, a cold case homicide. It has been confirmed that the case is Deanie's, but it has not yet been revealed just what exactly Frisbee had lied about. He also allegedly, quote, willfully impeded and interfered with other witnesses in the case. There is still a $25,000 reward in Deanie's case. Following her disappearance, her mother and stepfather moved to Arizona. John Peters has been ruled out as a suspect in the case. Deanie was declared legally dead in 1991, 10 years after she vanished. 14-year-old Dean Marie Peters was last seen at around 5 p.m. at Forest Hills Central Middle School in the 5800 block of Ada Drive in the city of Grand Rapids. Witnesses saw her leaving the gymnasium, but she has never been seen or heard from since. Deanie is a white woman with brown hair and brown eyes. When she went missing, she was between 5'2 and 5'3 and weighed around 110 pounds. She is a smoker, has pierced ears, and a birthmark on her lower back. Some agencies list her surname as Pyle Peters. She was last seen wearing a brown ski jacket, pink sweatshirt, 27 to 32 inch blue Levi jeans, white knee high socks, and a cream colored scarf with the word ski written on it in dark brown letters. If Deanie is still alive, she will be 55 years old. If you have any information about her disappearance, you can contact the Kent County Sheriff's Office on 616-336-3113.
David Scott Abramovitz. Our next case location is brought to you by our patron Law, who chose Morristown in New Jersey. Dubbed the military capital of the American Revolution for its part in the war for independence from Britain, Morristown is full of history, art, and culture, and is the location of some of New Jersey's most puzzling cases. Described as reserved, gentle, and gifted, David Scott Abramovitz was born on April 23, 1978, and spent some of his childhood in an affluent suburb of New York City with his parents and two sisters. From a young age, the importance of wealth was impressed upon David, but he had no interest in money or becoming financially well off. The 9 to 5 life he felt was not for him. A vegan from a young age, David stopped wearing leather and swore off Twizzlers as a teen, and his siblings described him as a free spirit. David attended Morristown High School, where he captained both the track team and the cross country team. He was a talented pianist who spoke fluent French and loved to paint. He often did so in an expressionist style. Shortly before he vanished, he gave his sister, Jill, a portrait, which is hung in her home to this day. David also volunteered at the Seeing Eye in Morris Township, where he worked with dogs. He was well known for his love of mountain climbing, nature, and animals. David graduated from Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey in 2000. During his time there, he'd dated a young woman who recalled how much he was interested in the book Into the Wild, a non-fiction novel that was based on the story of Christopher McCandless. McCandless graduated from university in Georgia in 1990, and afterwards made his way to Alaska, where he planned to live off the land. He had always wanted to pursue a nomadic lifestyle, and is described as an adventurer. However, McCandless's journey came to an end shortly after he made his way into the wild, when he died of starvation in 1992. David's girlfriend noted that he was a good boyfriend, and that they'd split amicably, with both expressing a desire to go their separate ways. 23-year-old David was last seen on May 3rd, 2001, when he left the family home on Bickford Drive near the Randolph border. He has never been seen since. Investigators discovered that his phone had either made calls from Burlington, Vermont, or possibly received them shortly after he vanished. The search for David took his family and detectives to Queechy, Vermont, 70 miles south of Burlington. The 23-year-old had reportedly spoken of the gorge there, which is 165 feet deep, some time before he went missing. David's family canvassed the area, going door to door and visiting both hotels and shelters, looking for anyone with even a scrap of information. Meanwhile, expert climbers were brought in to search the gorge. However, there were no signs of the missing 23-year-old. David Abramovitz had essentially vanished into thin air. His sisters, Jill and Stephanie, continued to look for answers in the case. They recalled that their sibling was depressed at the time, with Stephanie telling Morristowngreen.com that his depression is often what made him escape the area, saying he wanted to be off with animals and nature. Shortly before David went missing, he gave away a few of his belongings and withdrew all of his money from his bank account. Three days after he vanished, his family got a call from his best friend, who said that he had just received a depressing letter from their loved one. The Charlie Project calls this letter a suicide note, although his sisters disagree with this description after speaking with experts about the letter's contents. David had visited his best friend in California for a few weeks and afterwards had penned the letter, which discussed how much the friendship meant to him and how much he enjoyed the visit. He also wrote vaguely, I'm going away. His sisters remembered that he had said a similar thing to them around the same time. He had said, I'm going on an adventure. I need to figure things out. However, David refused to elaborate on this further. For his depression, the 23-year-old had tried to go on medication, but found that it suppressed his desire to paint. The investigation into David's disappearance has come to a standstill in recent years. His father passed away in 2013, never knowing what became of his only son, while his grandparents, who were alive when he vanished in 2001, have also died since he went missing. His mother continues to live in the family home, while his sisters speculate on what may have happened to their brother. Jill believes David is in Vermont, while Stephanie thinks her brother is in Canada. Both believe he is still alive and living a new life, off the grid, surrounded by nature, animals, and the mountains, the place where he always felt most at home. 
There are generally three theories in David's case. That he took his own life, that he's happily living off the grid, or that he planned to do the latter, but has since died due to the elements or starvation, much like Christopher McCandless. Of her brother's disappearance, Jill said, It's that horrible thing where you want closure and you also want hope. You cling to anything. 23-year-old David Scott Abramovitz was last seen leaving his home on Bickford Drive in Morristown, New Jersey on May 3rd, 2001. David is a white male with brown hair and brown eyes. He stands at around 6 foot 1 and weighed between 145 to 155 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He usually wore a rope choker necklace and had it on when he vanished. He also has a gap between his front teeth and sometimes used the nickname Dave. If he is still alive, he will be 43 years old. If you have any information about David's disappearance, you can call the Morris Township Police Department on 973-539-0777. Tone Truong. Moving on to our third case. This one is from our patron Hannah, who chose the Melbourne suburb of Sunshine as their location. Starting off as a town just outside Victoria's capital city, Sunshine was known to be home to many manufacturing businesses, which eventually began to dwindle in the 1970s. Now a residential suburb, it still houses many industrial companies and is an important retail centre. It is also the site of several strange cold cases. 43-year-old Tone Truong was described by his brother Tai as your stereotypical larrikin. He had a good job as an engineer and was loved by all who knew him and was said to have the whole world ahead of him. Detectives who worked the Vietnamese man's case echoed these sentiments, adding that he was a hard-working family man. On February 23rd, 2015, sometime between 5 and 5.25 a.m., Tone was awoken by the sound of someone breaking into his home in Sunshine West. His wife, who was eight months pregnant at the time, is believed to have disturbed the intruder. Tone rushed to her defense, chasing the uninvited guest into one of the bedrooms upstairs. Then gunshots rang out. The gunman fled the bloody scene as Tone called to his wife, asking her to ring emergency services. The 43-year-old, who had been living in Australia for a number of years, had been shot twice. He died before paramedics arrived. It is believed that the gunman then left the area using his car, which was parked nearby. The vehicle was last seen on CCTV heading towards Fitzgerald Avenue. Investigators quickly discovered the shattered glass at the back of the house, which indicated that the killer had broken in through a window. At the time, it was unknown if Tone had been targeted or if he was the victim of a random robbery gone wrong. Police dispatched teams of officers to search the nearby area for any trace of the gunman or the weapon he used. They emptied bins as they looked for the gun and combed through Allison Street and the surrounding area, looking for anything that could help the investigation. However, they came up empty-handed. Inside the home, detectives found that Tone had recently begun growing a crop of cannabis in an upstairs bedroom. His family were surprised by the news, and his wife knew nothing of it. She told the authorities that her husband told her he was decorating the room for the new baby, and that he wanted it to be a surprise. As a result, she made sure to stay away from the room until it was ready. Following this discovery, investigators theorized that the 43-year-old's cannabis setup had caught the attention of two men who were seen driving around the area at the time of his death. Over a year later, in December of 2016, the police stated their belief that the senseless crime was carried out by an associate of a syndicate that carried out aggravated burglaries at properties with cannabis crops in the suburbs of Melbourne. The Australian newspaper The Age reported that the gang is fluid and could contain as many as 50 people. They are thought to be responsible for a string of robberies in the area and use infrared cameras to help determine which homes they should target. One of these cameras was stolen from a local fire station. In August of 2015, using a description given by Tone's wife, police created a composite image of what the culprit may look like. He is described as being a thin, white man who is around 5 foot 5 with green eyes. He also wore a blue face mask and a black cap. However, despite the creation of the E-Fit, this man has never been identified. Another clue in the case is the dark-coloured sedan seen on CCTV fleeing the scene. 
Investigators believe it is either a BMW two-door or a Ford Falcon sedan. Both were seen in the area around 45 minutes before the crime, and authorities are interested in learning more information about the drivers of both vehicles. However, neither driver has ever been identified. It is believed that Tone was growing the marijuana to earn some extra income, although his family have said that he earned good money and they didn't understand why he would need the extra. Investigators noted that the 43-year-old was yet to harvest a crop. He'd only just started growing the cannabis. His brother told media outlets, my brother did a stupid thing. He made a mistake, and for that, he's paid with his life. A month after Tone's death, his wife gave birth to the couple's first daughter. They already had a three-year-old son who was in the house on the night of the murder, but was luckily unharmed during the ordeal. According to the family, the 43-year-old spouse struggled to put her life back together following the vicious crime and suffered lasting trauma from the experience. The area in which the couple lived was previously known to be a safe and quiet neighborhood, but locals have stated that in the few years before Tone's demise, it gained a reputation for violence and crime. Tone's case is still unsolved. If you have any information about his death, you can call Crime Stoppers on 1-800-333-000. Logan Bowman. Our penultimate case this month was chosen by our patron Cheyenne, who picked the city of Fries, Virginia. Although we were unable to locate a cold case from this exact location, we found one just 15 minutes away in the city of Galax. On January 26th, 2003, at 12.59 p.m., the Grayson County Sheriff's Office received a strange phone call from a woman named Cynthia Lee Davis. The woman requested that she speak to somebody about a kidnapping and claimed that her son was hurt and that her boyfriend, a man named Dennis Danny Shemahorn, was holding her hostage. She reported that she hadn't seen her son since January 5th, but later changed the date to January 9th. When a sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene, Davis claimed that while she was asleep, her son, five-year-old Logan Nathaniel Bowman, ran hot water for a bath and got burned pretty bad. She then said that he'd been missing since January 7th and noted that her boyfriend didn't allow her to take Nathaniel to the doctor when he burned himself. Over the following months, Davis would go on to give various different accounts of Logan's whereabouts, the circumstances of his disappearance, and the abuse she had suffered at the hands of her boyfriend, Shemahorn. Davis claimed that Shemahorn held her hostage for two weeks and physically assaulted her with a flashlight and later in court said that he held a gun to her head and threatened to shoot her. He had also once previously attempted to strangle her. As for her son's whereabouts, Davis claimed that Logan had a stomach bug and had soiled himself in the middle of the night. This is why he attempted to run a bath himself and ended up burning himself in the hot water. Eventually, Davis alleged that Logan was with his father, Alvin Bowman, and that he'd bring the five-year-old home later. But this was not the case. It is believed that Logan was last seen alive on January 7th, 2003. It's unclear why his mother waited over two weeks to report her child missing. According to the Charlie Project, she filed a missing persons report on January 23rd, although other sources state that it was Logan's father, Alvin, who reported him missing on January 27th. Davis was unable to explain why she hadn't reported her son's disappearance much sooner, and as a result, immediately became a suspect in the investigation. One month after Logan vanished, Davis was charged with child endangerment. Additionally, Dennis Shemahorn was also charged in connection with Logan's disappearance and the incident that saw the five-year-old's lower body burned by hot water. Investigators noticed that Shemahorn gave numerous conflicting statements during the course of the inquiry. Alvin Bowman claimed that the last time he saw his son was on Christmas Day, 2002. He had weekend visitation rights, but had been blocked from seeing Logan by Davis and Shemahorn. An article by the Carroll News states that Bowman testified in court that he went to collect Logan on January 3rd, but was told his son was sick. On January 9th, Davis told Bowman in a voicemail that the five-year-old was still ill and she was taking him to the doctor. She added that he didn't need to come and pick him up. On January 17th, Bowman went to Shemahorn's trailer where Logan and Davis lived in Sherwood Trailer Park near Galax, but no one answered the door. The following day, he returned to the trailer only to be met by Shemahorn, who told him that Davis had taken Logan and left. 
Bowman went back again on the 19th, but Shemahorn told him that the pair weren't there. At this point, Logan's father called the school, only to learn that he had been missing from class since December 20th, 2002, which is when the school had broken up for the Christmas holidays. After discovering this, Bowman notified social services and the sheriff's department about how he was unable to locate his son. Shortly before Logan last attended class, his teacher had noticed some bruising on his body that may have been physical abuse. According to the Charlie Project, the teacher only notified social services after the five-year-old went missing. However, the Doe Network claims that the teacher reported the abuse on November 19th, 2002. In April of 2003, both Davis and Shemahorn were indicted on two counts, each of child neglect. The first count was for failure to take Logan to a doctor after he burned himself. The second was for failure to report him missing for over two weeks. A few months later in July, the pair were also charged with felony murder. Cynthia Davis pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 15 years in prison and 20 years of probation. She testified against Shemahorn and claimed that Logan was burned in the bathtub on January 7th, but that Shemahorn wouldn't allow her to take the five-year-old to the hospital. He apparently told her to calm herself first. According to Davis, she fell asleep, and then when she woke up, Logan was gone. Shemahorn told her that his mother was a nurse, so he'd taken Logan there. Davis said that she never saw her son again after that. Shemahorn's mother, Margaret Brando, told investigators that she had last seen Logan on January 8th when she visited the couple at her son's trailer. The five-year-old was reportedly lying on the couch, still and quiet, only his head sticking out from beneath a blanket as he lay on a love seat. She said she believed he was sleeping. Meanwhile, Shemahorn claimed that Davis had taken Logan and his car and left. When she returned, she didn't have Logan with her. Shemahorn said he thought Davis had sold her son. He also told authorities that not only had the five-year-old burned himself, but that a 15-inch television had once fallen on him too. Shemahorn's attorney accused Davis of selling Logan, but she denied the allegation. While on the stand, she confessed that she was never held captive by her boyfriend but she did state that she was afraid of him. In May of 2004, a judge dismissed the murder charge and one of the child neglects charges that had been laid against Shemahorn, citing a lack of evidence. It was Davis's testimony that accounted for much of the evidence against him, but her statements were determined to be self-serving and inconsistent. As we mentioned earlier, she told numerous different stories about Logan's whereabouts and the circumstances of his disappearance, and on the witness stand, she said she thought he might still be alive. Shemahorn was convicted on one count of child neglect and sentenced to one year in prison. His attorney said that he had credit for time already served and may spend only one month behind bars. Although Logan's mother has been convicted in connection with his death, his case is still unresolved. The exact circumstances of his death are unknown and his body has never been found. If Davis really did sell him, he has never been located, and nobody has come forward with any useful information which would help find and identify him. Five-year-old Logan Nathaniel Bowman was last seen on January 7th, 2003. He is a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes, and when he was last seen, he stood at three foot two and weighed around 30 pounds. He had decayed teeth, a healing fracture in his left arm, and fresh burns on most of his lower body at the time of his disappearance. If he is still alive, he will be 24 years old. If you have any information about Logan's disappearance, you can call the Grayson County Sheriff's Office on 276-773-3241. Robert Pride McLeod. Our final case location this month comes from an anonymous patron who chose the town of Harrogate in North Yorkshire, England. 49-year-old Robert Pride McLeod stood at 5 foot 2 and weighed just 70 pounds when he showed up in Harrogate in January of 2007. During a visit to the town's hospital, he declared himself homeless and, as a result, was given a room at the local hostel named Cavendish House on Robert Street. The small hostel, which no longer exists, consisted of seven rooms and one flat, all of which were occupied at the time of Robert's death. The 49-year-old checked into the hostel at around 11.45 p.m. on January 12th. He was given a first-floor room. Little is known about Robert's background and earlier life, and it is unclear how he came to be homeless. 
Before moving to Harrogate, he had been living with friends in the village of Burtswith for years. It was later discovered that he had changed his name from Timothy to Robert around five years prior to his death. Additionally, the 49-year-old had a heart condition, suffered from psychiatric issues, and required a wheeled frame to help him walk. Three days after Robert checked in, on January 15th, his room was found empty. It wasn't until a week later, on January 21st, that his body had been found in the cellar of the hostel. He had suffered from a head injury after being beaten, and although it was clear he'd been murdered, the coroner, who expressed disgust at the fact the 49-year-old had been left to die so heinously, was forced to record an open verdict, as authorities were unable to garner enough evidence and information to prove otherwise. Not much has been documented about the investigation into Robert's death. After his post-mortem revealed he had suffered head injuries, the police opened a murder investigation, although they failed to ever crack the case. During the initial inquiry, three people, including one man, one woman, and a 17-year-old, were arrested on suspicion of murder and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, but were never charged. Later on in the investigation, three other youths were arrested, although again, no charges were made. Reportedly, on the day of Robert's death, a 17-year-old was having a birthday party at the hostel where other young people were present. The group engaged in drinking and taking marijuana. Detectives believe that it was during this time the 49-year-old was lured into the cellar where he was assaulted and left to succumb to his injuries. According to one investigator, a female witness heard Robert being bounced off the walls and doors and later saw him lying in a pool of blood. The witness didn't call for help or intervene, however, as she was afraid for her own safety. She retreated to her room, where she locked herself in. Detectives have said that those who knew he was down there did not attempt to save him or call for help, with Detective Sergeant Matt Walker saying, he was left to die in a cold, damp, dark environment in the middle of winter. In more recent years, Robert's case has been reopened twice, once in 2015 and once more in 2017. But despite fresh appeals for information and a £5,000 reward, the case is still cold. It is currently being handled by the North Yorkshire Police's Major Crimes Unit. In 2017, Detective Sergeant Walker told the media that he believed several suspects and witnesses had previously lied to the police. Investigators have also suggested that back in 2007, people may have been reluctant to speak with them, but that loyalties may have changed over a decade later. They were also hopeful that new forensic science techniques would lead to a result, although so far, this has sadly not been the case. If you have any information about Robert's demise, you can call North Yorkshire's major investigation team at 01609 643 147, or alternatively, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. And there you have the facts. Thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon, and good luck to all those entering in next month's prize draw. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.